My, my, my. What a pleasure this is. It's not too often that I can greet esteemed guests in this most ghastly of locations. Don't worry, of course. The rest of the quarter is far, far more luxurious. The delicacies harvested from worlds the other side of the rift. The marbled facades, masterpieces in their own right. But you are lucky enough to be received here. I should tell you, few are ever permitted to witness the delights of our dungeons. We call it the Tomb Eternal, of course. I hope you'll forgive the dramatic flair, but it was named many millennia ago, and the name has proved fitting so far. Not a single soul outside of the family has seen these walls and left them. Perhaps the God Emperor himself guided my ancestors' hands when they named it thus. Or not, regardless if the shoe fits. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Am I boring you? Am I repeating facts that you are already well aware of? I do apologize. Why didn't you say something? Ah, yes. Your vocal cords are gone, aren't they? Completely slipped my mind for a moment there. Nasty little things they are. Why, your vocal cords betrayed even your deepest, darkest secrets. What perfidy. Such disloyalty had to be punished, of course. Due to the assiduous efforts of our staff, whom, may I also add, are excellent at what they do. All those little deals that you made just slipped right out, didn't they? Well, you can thank me, thank the entire house for our service. What if, throne forbid the thought, we released you, and those flaps of muscle betrayed you once more? No, no, no. Far better for you to lose such a two-faced ally. However, we come to the crux of the matter. You thought you were better than us. Oh, I care not for your attempts to inveigle your way into our palace, the murders you are plotting, nor for the bombs you planted to maintain your egress. But you thought you were better? My family's legacy is that of millennia. My pedigree stands echelons above gutter scum such as you. Mine is the power to see, know, and understand the realm of hell and divine, blinding light both. I am one of the few who can truly witness the glory of our God Emperor. And you? You are a mercenary. A common criminal, with a little more skill than the average one, I'll admit. But you are nothing. You are no one. You aren't even a footnote in the tale of our Imperium. I do wonder why you took the job, of course. Did they promise you anything in particular? Fleets? Generational partnerships with their offspring guiding you and yours through the stars? Did they convince you of planetary governorship over some backwater garden world with a future of nothing more than drinking and copulating yourself to death? Please don't tell me it was for money. Mere money. For one such as us. Thrown above, that would be the worst insult of all. That upstart house can barely trace their existence back a few thousand years, and they thought they could make plays on me and mine? Ha! May as well take a shovel to a titan. Hmm. Perhaps I should give you more than they could offer. Hmm? Shall I do that? Give you something that is beyond price, beyond legacy. Something that you would never otherwise experience. What would you do for that? Look at me now. Look closely. I will show you an existence beyond your own. An endless realm of limitless ideas. Seas of madness, oceans of torment, fathomless existences and experiences that transcend temporal laws. But most of all, the realm of our God Emperor and we, his trusted navigators. 
Look at me. Look at me. Look at me! In the grim darkness of the far future of 40k, there is only war. It lingers in the far fringes of the galaxy and tarnishes the polluted soils of holy terror. It is waves of Xenos menaces swarming entire sectors beneath their horrific, slavering-jawed masses and heretical, abominable rituals conducted in whispers within abandoned sublevels of hive cities. It is an endless grind against the oncoming dark. It is humanity's defiance against fate. The Imperium of Man does not go gentle into that good night. It burns and raves and rebels across its strongholds both far and near. On every level, the Imperium is suffocated by war. Worlds churn out millions of troops to join the Astra Militarum, their only contribution to a galaxy of war, the men and women who bear the most basic of weapons, their short lives only to be used to absorb an enemy's incoming fire, and then to be replaced by the next sorry soul in the meat grinder of war. Alongside the Imperial Guard fight the Space Marines, the Adeptus Astartes, the Emperor's Angels of Death. Travelling throughout the worst of the Imperium's warfronts to deliver crushing blows with their ceramite armoured fists. War engines that can raise entire continents are transported through the stars. Their planet fall, the result of days of calculations and logistics, only to arrive and fire with overwhelming force before being retrieved and sailed on to the next warfront. Throughout every battlefront, every outpost, every sector, hive and frontier, resources are traded, bartered, delivered, commissioned and received. Medicine, sustenance, ammunition, technologies, economic goods and building materials, these ships traverse the endless black between worlds, braving the void on every voyage, blasting out into the dark, not knowing if this is the last time they set foot on a terrestrial object. Many believe it is the Emperor that holds this fractured, decrepit empire on its feet. Others believe it is the endless armies of the Astra Militarum, Astartes and Arbites that maintain the rule of order by force of arms throughout the galaxy. They are all of them wrong. It is the individuals born of humanity but not a part of it. It is those who witness the horrors of the other world without spiralling into insanity that maintain the Imperium of Man. It is the Navis nobility the navigators who maintain the endless number of trade ships, frigates, cruisers and battleships that traverse the stars. Without them, we would be pinpricks of light among the black. Without them, we would be snuffed out, one by one, forever to be forgotten among a cruel, cruel universe, lost to the whims of dark gods and intergalactic horrors. They are mutants, freaks, abominations, genetically twisted human stock far removed from the baseline of humanity. And yet they are our lifeblood. Welcome one and all, I'm Azazel. And for better or worse, you have stumbled your way onto my video detailing the navigators of the Warhammer 40k universe or if you prefer the high gothic term Navis Nobility. Quick side note, I will be launching a thousand subscriber giveaway once I achieve that goal, where a single subscriber will receive a 40k themed, hand burned, wooden board absolutely free of charge, courtesy of myself and another small company, whose name will be revealed after I launch the giveaway. All costs including postage and packaging will be covered by myself, so keep an eye out for that video when it goes live and you may receive a little 40k gift. So remember to drop a subscribe and prepare to follow the instructions when it goes live. Anyway, what follows is an introduction to navigators, in my own words, for those of you who are looking for more of an explanation to the universe. If you're an experienced veteran of the hobby and lore, then don't be surprised if you already know all I have to introduce here. Simply listen along while you paint your models and I hope you enjoy it. 
Be prepared now. Steel your hearts and gird your minds as we enter the most horrific place imaginable. The place where hope goes to die and where thirsting gods rack the souls of billions while directing madness on the stage of our galaxy as easily as puppeteers pull on strings. Welcome to the 41st Millennium. In every sci-fi setting, there exists a path through the stars, some form of faster-than-light travel. Star Wars has hyperdrives, Stargate has wormholes, Star Trek has warp drives. In the setting of Warhammer 40k, humanity does not have access to faster-than-light travel technology in its strictest sense. Instead, humanity travels through the warp to receive the same effect. The laws of time and space are vastly different in this realm. Journeys that would take hundreds, even thousands of years can be made in a matter of weeks or months through the Immaterium, the Otherworld, the Warp, the Sea of Souls, the Empyrean. Therefore, humanity uses a warp drive to carve open a route into the Immaterium. However, this by itself is not enough to ensure a successful voyage. Each ship must maintain a bubble of reality around itself to protect against the insanity of this realm. This is ensured by something called a Geller Field. Finally, to navigate a universe of madness, emotion and chaos is nigh impossible for those of us blind to its currents. Thus, the Navigator comes into play. Only they have the ability to stare into this nightmarish landscape and comprehend the currents and spatial contradictions that exist there. Navigators act as second mates on a ship, charting the courses, navigating vortices of rage, tempests of destruction and hurricanes of horror that would tear apart ships in the blink of an eye. Without the navigators and their gifts, we could enter the warp, but we would never leave it. And even if we did, it would be up to the whims of fate where our ships may end up. Within the rolling tides of the Empyrean, it could be six months later on one edge of the galaxy, or six thousand years later on the other side entirely. It is they who keep our ships sailing the stars. They who are crucial in transporting the men, vehicles, weapons, equipment and food and other necessaries required to prosecute the Imperium's never-ending state of war. They are the lubricant that keeps the overbearing machine of the Imperium functioning. Without them, it would break entirely and irreparably. Navigators are almost human. In fact, they are mutated humans. However, this specific strain of mutant is deemed to be relatively stable and bears no threat to humanity's biological pool so long as the mutants in question ensure that their lineages continue within their own breed. It's a beautiful example of Imperial hypocrisy. Keep humanity pure and purge mutants across the galaxy, apart from the ones who are incredibly useful, or in this case absolutely essential to the infrastructure of the Imperium. Thus are navigators both shunned and lauded in equal measure. For who would slight the incredibly powerful figures with monopolies over the Imperium's martial and political might? Yet you wouldn't want to be too close with such unclean versions of humanity. Thus do these mutants enjoy a mixed reception throughout the galaxy. Never loved, yet always appreciated. Detested, yet revered. But what is mutated about these humans? Well, let's start with a glaringly obvious part the Navigator's third eye. Navigators, as a general rule, are born with a third eye in the middle of their brow. It resembles a normal human eye at birth, and gradually alters over time, with the repeated trials of gazing into the tides of the Empyrean and witnessing the unreality that lies behind the veil of our own universe. It blackens and hardens into something akin to an orb of jet. Such mutations as extra eyes are sadly not greatly uncommon across the galaxy. In most instances, the individual in question is labelled a mutant and immediately disposed of. For good measure, the biological parents of such offspring would likely be killed or questioned under suspicion of warp taint. 
However, for navigators, the situation is very different. The extra eye that each one carries only serves a purpose in conjunction with the navigator gene that lies within their very DNA. Without this gene, an eye is simply an eye. The navigator gene allows these individuals to perceive the war. Not only that, but to perceive it without losing their minds, souls and spirits in the process. Nietzsche himself wrote, When you stare into the abyss, the abyss stares back at you. And so this eye, this extension of their prefrontal cortex, acts as a periscope into the war. It allows them to view it from a different angle, to make sense of the senseless and view patterns in the chaos. It allows them to view the innate connection that all humanity shares within the war. For a regular human, the ability to peel back the layers of reality and look into the raw power of uncreation would shred the mind into pieces. To experience unbound emotion in its purest form, to view white-hot rage, boiling desire, the mechanisms of fate and chance, the entropic onslaught of the galaxy would be a burden greater than any could bear. However, navigators can see the man behind the curtain, albeit in their own way, for even their minds must be hardened to this most colossal of tasks. Many will visualize a simpler facade on this unreality as they begin their training in navigating the stars. They may view the warp in their mind's eye as a forest, with the only route to safety the path that meanders through the woods. But many choose other metaphors with which to digest the insanity of views that lay within the warp. With training and experience, greater control and greater depth of self, they become inured to the impossibilities and can view the warp in all its glories and horrors. To be a navigator is to know more than your fellow humanity. For these individuals ply the starways in glorious ships. In their hands lie the souls of millions on a single journey. They are the guides to fleets and merchants across a galaxy of stars. And only they can understand what truly lies beyond. For it is one thing to know of the warp. To understand that legions of thirsting horrors await for the weakening of a Gela field. To be told that slavering demons are attempting to crash down the barriers and consume your emotions and your soul. To hear of the four great sentences that are akin to gods slaking their thirst on humanity's horror. It is another to view that hellish landscape. To witness the inferno of Dante and spend your days traipsing across things that never were and always will be. That is the price of a navigator. In terms of other powers and mutations that navigators hold, the question is a slightly trickier one. Due to the fact that they are mutants, mutation and the randomness of chance that accompanies this factor runs rampant. This can manifest in a number of different ways. Some navigators may be able to view and sever the connection that binds demons to their host bodies in the materium. Others may open the power of the warp through their eye to immolate nearby enemies within the view of their third eye. Most navigators, simply by revealing their third eye, can fracture the soul and overwhelm the body, mind and spirit of any who gaze into its depths. Now, while navigators are emphatically not psychers as far as the law goes, if there's a requirement in the plot for something to happen that is vaguely warp psycho related and there is no psycho around to perform said action, then the navigator can probably manage it. Plot armor and all that jazz. However, there are a few absolutely fascinating mutations regarding navigator culture that we need to mention. Let's begin with what I consider the juiciest tidbit. Remember, navigators are mutants. They are abnormal. Aberrations, according to certain viewpoints. A degradation or alteration of the human condition. A biological variance where there should be none. Yet they are permitted, lauded and valued. So clearly they are a stable mutation. Yet they are not so stable. 
Their diversion from the pure genome of humanity has left the navigators vulnerable to other mutations. Despite their attempts at crossing favoured bloodlines, breeding out vulnerabilities and encouraging useful mutations, their genetic adaptability, which allows this feature, also makes them susceptible to mutation in a different way. Each navigator unravels over time. For deep in the vaults of the navigators dwell the elders of each navigator house. These ancient individuals are vastly respected due to their many years of experience and skill to not only master their professions, but to survive the trials and agonies of it. Yet only those of the houses themselves may visit these nightmarish horrors, for in the visage of these elders shows the true price of mutants. Scaled skin, webbed feet, abnormal bloating, excessive height, gaunt-ridden features, characteristics that would normally be loathed by the Imperium and associated with chaos worship. These run rampant through the bodies of the Elders, hence why each navigator is destined for one of a few fates. Die in the vastness of space in a fiery explosion of space debris. Be consumed by the vicious nightmares haunting the universe from the other side of the veil. Or be hidden in the vaults of the navigator's quarter while your corporeal form twists and turns itself into a mockery of the humanity it once resembled. Each and every faction in the galaxy has secrets wrought of shame, and navigators would kill any who sought their twisted elders in the dark. Their genetic instability is not merely a time-driven unravelling of the human genome, however. The Navis offspring are incredibly prone to mutations, therefore their entire society relies on gene scryers and psychic divination in order to affect the optimal breeding matches to produce stable offspring. Yet, even with the best precautions that their inordinate amount of resources can buy, there is a chance always a chance that a newborn navigator could be no more than a bundle of struggling, writhing mass with a single black eye. My second favourite mutation is something altogether more mysterious. While the elders of each house guide their scions from the dark, it is the novators of each house that are the public head of the household. The Novator will guide their economic efforts, sign deals on new trade agreements, and use political manoeuvring to garner favour with particularly prosperous individuals. However, above the Novators stands the Paternova, a king or queen among these mutants. The Paternova exists as the lifeblood of the Navigator Houses, for, despite living up to a thousand years, hidden in isolation within the Palace of Navigators on Terra, upon the death of the Paternova, something mysterious happens. Navigators from all across the Imperium weaken, their psychic senses wane, and thousands are lost within the warp at each of these critical junctures. The strength of the Navigators is swept away at the death of this the most powerful of their kind. However, the Novators of each house grow stronger. Each heir apparent is gifted with greater power and mutations both physical and psychic. Stronger in mind, body and soul, each Novator becomes more aggressive and gains the ability to survive the harshest of environments, be that underwater, in toxic gases or even the void of space. One by one, they engage in battles to their death, their strength seeking out strength to eliminate the threats to their potential ascension, and with each battle won, they mutate further. In these rare circumstances, each Novator is killed one by one, until a victor emerges. By this point, the Novator has transformed into something else. A power unto themselves the wellspring of Navigator Power, a demigod of terrifying proportions. From the moment a Novator has ascended to Paternova, they are sequestered within the palace, never to leave again. Only the Paternoval envoy may speak with their own voice, 
and upon the ascension of the new Patanova, the powers of the navigators across the galaxy begin to return. However, this period of upheaval does cause some long-lasting effects among the various houses, with navigators of the previous Patanova's household becoming significantly weaker than before, and the navigators of the new Patanova's household becoming significantly stronger. Mutant bloodlines, psychic aberrations and mysterious power surges, the navigators of 40k have it all. Let's try and breeze along a little, shall we? The Society of the Navigators is a quagmire of dangerous politics, salacious secrets and economic campaigns. Much as swimming through the warp is dangerous, so too is the life of a navigator. The navigator houses themselves do not maintain fighting forces like many other factions and powers that exist within the Imperium of Man do. While they do maintain their own household guards, forces of men and women who are trained and armed with the best that their vast fortunes can provide, the power of many of these houses lies in deals, treaties and shipping lanes. The House Belisarius, for example, has had a treaty with the Space Wolves chapter since they were a legion. 10,000 years ago, they served Lehman Russ and the Space Wolves, and in exchange for providing navigators for the Space Wolves' ships, they receive a small number of Space Wolves known as the Wolfblade. These Astartes serve as the bodyguard, right hand, and training masters for the house's mortal forces. Other navigator houses use their fortunes to hire vast numbers of mercenaries when the need arises. The Greater Houses will call upon smaller Navigator Houses who have pledged allegiance to them for centuries. In other times, an exchange of mercantile trade slips will do the same job as an army would. Yet, for a world of sabotage and subterfuge, of assassination and ire, the Navigators are forbidden from one thing, all-out war. They are too valuable to waste on unrestricted wars between Houses, the loss of a large number of navigators and their subsequent generations would cause irreparable damage to the Imperium's infrastructure. Thus are trade wars declared. These trade wars are fought according to the diktats of the ancient navigator convention and must be solved only through the direct confrontation of each house's members. Military maneuverings and trade embargoes designed to weaken an opposing house into capitulation Yet no parties outside of the two houses may be involved, or pay the price for their war. Yet all too often these houses drag third parties into such events, culminating in bloodshed and losses far beyond that which is desired. Therefore, a more common, or at least officially common, method of solving disputes lies in a good old-fashioned duel or if a showdown between two individuals capable of distorting reality by channeling ungodly amounts of warp energy can be called old-fashioned at least. There are no witnesses to a duel of this sort, apart from the duelists' seconds. There cannot be. Navigators are secretive by nature, and any witnesses not bearing the navigator gene would be annihilated. Their souls overcome with the raw power of the warp the moment they laid eyes on the third eyes of these duelists. So it is that, whether for honour, pride, vainglory, or insult, two navigators will uncover their third eyes and let the full, inescapable, overbearing, nightmarish truth of the warp rush at each other. It is a battle of control, to flood their opponent's senses with the roiling Empyrean while withstanding the unreality cascading towards themselves. Control, endurance, will and mindfulness are their tools to stare down Tartarus itself, while unleashing the playground of demons on your enemy. Despite the horrors of such an experience, navigator duels are rarely to the death. They are too valuable. If not in the immediate future, then each navigator understands that their breed needs to survive. Familial bloodlines will always be intertwined through the generations. Each loss to their ranks will only decrease their relatively stark gene pool, and thus increase mutations to an unsanctionable degree. Thus, the cost of these jewels are shame, 
humiliation and indignity, as well as whatever resources, trading deals or territories are ceded to the winner of such a duel. Now, I want to get to juicier parts, so let's pass over the navigator house types fairly quickly. First and foremost, preeminent among the navigator houses are the magisterial houses. These are what you would class as the aristocracy among the navigator houses. They are great, grand and glorified. Their holdings on Terra are obscenely rich, both in terms of the resources, space and history. Their lineages are traced back millennia, with only the most cunning, quick and resourceful surviving to this day. A real nest of political vipers. However, most starkly, these are the most stable of these twisted mutants. They have taken the greatest care with each generation to minimize the degradation of their gene lines. Thus are they the most well known, revered and despised. Secondly are the nomadic houses of the navigators. These wanderers and wayfarers hold no ground, do not limit themselves to a single planet, region or system. They are perpetually on the move within their vast fleets, their bloodlines maintained due to their numbers and the occasional match between other nomadic cousins. Whereas the magisterial houses conform to humanity's imperium and become great speakers, leaders and politicians in their own right, navigators of the nomadic houses are far less adaptable to the traditions of the common stock of humanity. What they lack in etiquette and relatability, however, they more than make up for in their skill. They are born to the Sea of Stars, drift along its currents more so than any navigator in the magisterial houses do. As such, they can navigate eddies within warp fluctuations that others would not dare. Their intuition comes from a lifetime of skill, warring within the realm of the impossible. Thirdly, are the shrouded houses. Outcasts, fallen, debased. These are houses as far removed from power as they can be. They dwell in ignominy. In the farthest reaches of the Imperium do they dwell, forever struggling to maintain their legacies, either fleeing from their recent shame or grappling to enhance their standing. These navigator houses have one strength. They are willing to do whatever it takes to grasp power. Lastly, we have the renegade houses. Damned, forsaken, lost and hunted. These renegades are often those houses that have spat on their sacred traditions and fallen ill of the Inquisition. For navigators, as mutants, must be stringent in their gene protocols. They are tolerated both due to their necessity in warp travel and because they are relatively stable, at least as far as mutants go. Those who eschew the guidelines, restrictions and warnings of mutated gene lines, usually out of a desire to produce stronger, more capable or niche particular powers within their houses, fall from grace immediately. With their blatant disregard to the stability of their bloodlines, they do indeed produce incredibly strong navigators, yet at the same time produce abominations, malformed, twisted, dark-powered things better left unborn. The Inquisition hunts these particular mutants with zeal, ferocity and glee, eager to snuff out the twisted atrocities so far removed from humanity's purity. Quick side note, I did consider regaling you with tales of some of the renegade houses. The horrors that they conceive, the abominations they produce, the twisted and demented beliefs of some of these mutants. But you will have to wait. I believe an entry on them will be far more satisfying in its own right, and I may have to include a story or two to really spice up the narrative as far as my meager skills will allow. Also, you may be wondering why I did not cover how the navigators steer their ships. This is for two reasons. One, I find it rather boring. They're plugged into the ship's cogitators and direct it. That's it. And two, it will overlap with some of my planned episodes in the future featuring the Mechanicus and Servitors. So, uh, side note over. As you can see, the Imperium needs navigators. 
Without the ability to navigate the Sea of Souls and cross the boundless voids of space, humanity's outposts would be lost amidst the dark. Floundering, helpless, lost to the savagery of the Xenos and heretics. On top of that, infrastructure would crumble. Entire agri-worlds would have more food than they could eat in their lifetimes, but succumb to the loss of various resources that flowed in from systems elsewhere. Likewise, tech worlds that churned out supplies for the Imperium's endless armies would grind to a horrific stop, lacking the materials and food to maintain its populations and production. The navigators understand this all too well, and capitalize on it. Yet they are also grossly aware of the deep-seated hatred that many of the Imperium have for them. Mutants, degenerated humanity, blasphemic gene lines from the depths of old night, radical groups both within and without the Inquisition would happily eradicate them if the possibility came out. The High Lords of Terror, ever making plays for temporal gain and power, would annihilate the freaks of the Navigator Houses if humanity ever found an alternate method of travel between the stars. So the question is not, what would humanity do if it didn't need navigators? That answer is obvious. A greater question is, what would navigators do in order to maintain their power? And with that, we shall explore a short scenario from the 31st millennium. At the height of the Horus Heresy, an age of rack and ruin, of fratricide and fear. The time when our greatest enemies were those shining beacons wrought to protect us. Let us visit the Catalus Warp Rift and the dark glass overlooking it. For the dark glass was a machine, similar in some ways to the Golden Throne on Terror capable of accessing areas of the warp and designed to be used by a psyker of formidable power. Yet for all its mysteries, it would never be as powerful as the Golden Throne. The Emperor, in his foresight, had commanded that a team investigate its inner workings in an attempt to advance his research on his webway project. Within this team was Pieter Acheliu, a talented navigator with a prodigious future ahead of him. Yet for all of their 53 years of work, the entire team perished. Chaos, panic and terror flooded their mortal minds and caused them to slaughter one another. Pieter, in his folly, attempted to open a portal to escape the ensuing madness, only to be burned, consumed and withered into a husk on the throne of dark glass. Enter the White Scars. Pursued by their kin, the Death Guard, annihilation loomed heavy on the White Scars' remnants, backed into this one system, this final hope that a way back to terror was possible through this dark glass. For they were aided by Vale, a human vassal of House Acheliu. It was his knowledge of his house's actions that guided the White Scars to this place, an area such a fiercely guarded, guarded secret that few knew of its existence. With the dark glass, the white scars would finally make it back to safety. But treachery struck. Not that of heretic legions, but of the navigator houses. For the Paternova himself had learned of the Emperor's webway project. This plan would guarantee humanity safe interstellar travel without braving the terrors and dangers of the warp. It would forego the need for navigators entirely. Thus, Vale was under the highest orders of his house to destroy that station at any cost. The navigators did not care that a civil war could destroy humanity, nor that a loyalist Primarch may fall. They were prepared to perform any treachery in order to maintain their lauded position in society. With that, Vale ensured the destruction of the Dark Glass Station. However, by luck or fate, Targutai Yesuge, the greatest of the Legion's Stormseers, sacrificed himself within the crumbling Dark Glass 
to open a portal for his legion and allow the White Scars to escape destruction at the hands of the Death Guard. As with all things in the Imperium of Man in the 41st millennium, treachery is as commonplace as the recycled air they breathe. Sub-factions within sub-factions will undermine, inhibit and impair allies and enemies alike in order to gain control, power or influence, regardless of the wider consequences. To be in this setting is to witness the worst of a galaxy of nightmares and suffer at the hands of those who should be called brothers. Thank you for listening, I do hope you enjoyed this little piece. I'll confess that it had been sitting around half written for some time, and I feel better having finally gotten around to finishing it. Also, I apologise for my voice, I had a few beers and a few cigarettes too many last night, but the show must go on. And with that said, please feel free to like, subscribe, comment something, anything you wish me to touch upon more in the future. Your input is welcomed, as, well, without you, no one would be listening. Now, do enjoy your day or night, and I hope you've indulged in some escapism from reality. For that's why we are here, isn't it? Until next time.